Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the History Forum. I'm Annie Johnson, Museum Manager of the Minnesota History Center. Today's guest is Daniel Kerr, Associate Professor of History at American University, where he also directs the Public History Program and is the Director of the Humanities Truck, a fully customized delivery truck that serves as an experimental mobile platform for collecting, exhibiting, preserving, and expanding dialogue around the humanities. For today's presentation on the recent roots of present day homelessness, Kerr will focus on the past 50 years, arguing that homelessness has deep roots in the shifting ground of urban labor markets, social policy, real estate development, the criminal justice system and corporate power. Rather than being attributable to the illness and inadequacies of the unhoused themselves, homelessness is a product of both structural and political dynamics shaping our cities. Please join me in welcoming him to the History Center. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make one quick correction. I did actually change the title. Um, and the reason for that is because I will go beyond 50 years. Uh, and I'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, but I think it will actually make this uh, talk a little bit more interesting. Um, <clears throat> Somehow this stuff works. Ah. There we go. So the talk uh, and the research is primarily rooted in some uh, research I did in Cleveland that forms um, the basis for my book, uh, Derelict Paradise, Cleveland um, Homelessness and Urban Development in Cleveland, Ohio. So a lot of the examples I'm gonna um, draw upon today are from Cleveland. I do think that you're gonna find a lot of parallels uh, and there's the ways in which uh, these are shaped by national policy, but also Cleveland um, was really at the forefront of many of these um, uh, changes in the late 19th, early 20th century that I'll talk about. And I think you may find parallels uh, here in St. Paul as well as in Minneapolis. <clears throat> Uh, oh, there we go, it finally worked. So um, the first question, um, oh, thank you. I can take this off. Uh, the, <laughs> the first question uh, really is, um, what is homelessness? If we're gonna explore the history of it and the origins of it uh, and um, really look at the roots of what we're talking about um, through through the, uh, 1999 through really this present year, I've been conducting long form as well as short form interviews with people who are experiencing homelessness, really to find out from their perspective what their analysis is of uh, homelessness and its causes. I've done over 300 of these different interviews as well as organized a series of workshops. Um, the themes that I'm gonna talk about today are, uh, arose from from uh, interviews that I did in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, that were followed by a series of workshops. There we go. That were followed by a series of workshops where we developed the following themes on the causes of homelessness. Uh, and this would have been done in the early 2000s, but I think is still relevant today. Um, one of the causes, uh, and these are not ranked in order, being the upscaling of downtown. Uh, the loss of cheap hotels, affordable hotels, uh, the neighborhood gentrification and the loss of affordable housing in the neighborhoods that um, people experiencing homelessness grew up in were raised, um, the rise of day labor, um, contingent temporary labor, and the impact that that has had on wages, uh, in particular, the meltdown of wages as uh, was discussed by the folks I talked about, I talked to, um, the expansion of the criminal justice system and the importance both of the criminalization of poverty, as well as the impact um, that having criminal records has on people's access to jobs and housing, creating um, what people thought of as the stigmatization of an entire category of people uh, and of a labor force. The collapse of the welfare system that goes hand in hand with this dependency on low wage jobs uh, and the growth of shelters. And here the shelters in my interviews were not perceived as kind of humanitarian endeavors, but rather as extensions of the criminal justice system referred to as many uh, as um, 
the open penitentiaries, which was at one point um, my working title for my book. So what I did as a historian was really trying to think about these different themes and figure out where does this story start? Where do I I'll tell this story? Um, certainly um, uh, as the, a, a very common place to start would be to talk about Ronald Reagan, President Reagan. Um, I think when I originally said the 50s, my intent was to start with uh, President Nixon uh, and really look at the transformation, um, the move away from what uh, um, was the urban renewal programs of the 1950s and 60s uh, to kind of the embrace of what's frequently referred to as new urbanism. Uh, but I'll, uh, but then I thought, huh, well, actually to really understand, I think the significance and importance of my book is really uh, to kind of bridge that period uh, of urban renewal, which I think has been fairly well studied and which I will talk about. And there's many important um, lessons that have been learned from other historians that are relevant today. But I think the valence on urban renewal becomes a lot more different. Our, our perspective on urban renewal becomes a lot more different when we look at the period prior to urban renewal as well as following urban renewal. And when I refer to as urban renewal, I'm also thinking about um, the federal policies of redlining, uh, the establishment of FHA uh, and the Homeowners Loan Corporation uh, in the 1930s that led to kind of the segregated real estate um, markets of the 20th century. Another place that's thinking about, of course, is thinking of the Hoovervilles of the 1930s, or even possibly going back uh, to the 1870s and thinking about tramps and hobos. Um, so where do I start? Of course, being a historian, I have, I, and of course I could keep going here. There we go, for some reason it's taking a little. Uh, but what I did decide to do uh, is start in 1877. And the reason for that is because when I went into the 1930s and I looked and saw um, and read about an institution called the Wayfarers Lodge, uh, there were, it became very clear that the logic behind the Wayfarers Lodge really informed the logic of late 20th century shelters. And so I wanted to understand the origins of that logic. And really that goes all the way back to the rise of the scientific charity movement um, which emerged with the railroad, uh, following the railroad rebellions of 1877. Um, in the midst of those rebellions, this was a <clears throat> report that was in the Cleveland newspaper, the Cleveland Leader. Um, the argument was uh, there is a, a miscellaneous gang of irresponsible characters, thieves, tramps, and vagabonds of the types that have infested all American cities since the war. They are under all circumstances and at all times the arch enemies of civilized society. It is against this class that the vigilance of the American cities, Cleveland among the rest, should now be exercised until this labor controversy on the railroads is settled. There was a significant concern about not knowing who these people were, uh, the people who were the tramps, the hobos who were, um, who were taking over these um, uh, uh, cities in Pittsburgh and Baltimore. And so there was, and there was also this real sense of precarity uh, among uh, the Cleveland industrialists about uh, their position. So <clears throat> what do they do following? There we go. Uh, well, the very first thing they do is form a militia and establish a Gatling gun battery, right? So that's the immediate uh, thing they do to protect the city. And then they construct an armory uh, with um, uh, the capacity to prevent the approach of the mob in the downtown uh, business district. Uh, but also very significantly and importantly, they established the scientific charity movement, which is led uh, by associated charities. Um, they, this, this movement had several principles that they were pushing. Uh, one important one was the privatization of relief. The idea that relief should not be seen as an entitlement, uh, but rather be distributed uh, via charity. That there needed to be the, uh, on the other side of this, the elimination of outdoor relief or public relief, the essentially giving of uh, various goods or services or cash uh, directly to people experiencing poverty. Uh, instead, um, uh, the, they needed to have a centralization of the administration of relief to ensure efficiency and to make sure 
that most importantly, that they were able to surveil um, uh, the uh, recipients of this relief and make sure that they were worthy. Uh, in order to do that, by <clears throat> eliminating what was called outdoor relief, they replaced it with a concept that they referred to as indoor relief, that in order to access relief, they would have to go through an institution called the Wayfarers Lodge, uh, which was the uh, essentially the emergency shelter of the day, and that they would have to go through a work test, which was uh, to chop wood uh, at the wood lot. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. And so this really became kind of the primary way to separate the deserving from the undeserving, uh, the wood lot. And as I will argue very shortly, this seems kind of funny now, but this has, I argue, been replaced by the Alcoholic Anonymous meeting, the NA meeting, that's essentially become the equivalent of the woodlot of today's shelter. Um, <clears throat> by the 1890s, one of the things they discovered is that their efforts, and I should say, they were principally going after what they referred to as disorganized charity. The idea that all these different religious groups were operating their own charities, they weren't sharing information about the people they were giving to, um, that this was creating a, a group of irresponsible characters that were taking advantage of this and that we weren't able to monitor. Uh, and so uh, they then decided that in order to essentially control charity better, they needed to create what was known as the community chest, which is the forerunner uh, for United Way. Uh, and they did that uh, and um, orchestrated and distributed the money through the Federation of Charities, again, to efficiently direct the stream of relief, but to make sure also that every person who received relief would be investigated and that these records would be shared among the different relief agencies. Um, they, um, again, wanted to make sure that they would not subsidize able-bodied men to be idle, uh, lascivious leeches. Uh, and you can see this, this notion of um, pathology here is that the, those who are taking advantage of the system are those who are unwilling to work, right? That being kind of the core, and that's why the work test um, was so significant. Um, <clears throat> they organized campaigns in uh, the early 20th century as they developed this, this, the um, community test in the Federation of Charities to fight against indiscriminate giving on the streets um, and shut down um, soup kitchens are fought to shut down unsuccessfully soup kitchens that were run outside of the, um, uh, Federation, of, uh, the Federation of Charities. They also um, were very wary of the flop houses and the employment agencies. This area was where they had the least success. They did establish their own employment agency, the Associated Charities, um, but um, uh, still the primary way in which people who were um, access, there were still a significant number of um, working class cheap hotels throughout the downtown business district. And I'll talk about that in a second. Oh, I'm going backwards again, there we go. Oh, it's working better. Okay, and this being one of the hotels in here, the idea was this is a place um, where folks could go and stay and there would be essentially no records of who they were. There was little understanding of who was staying there. And the idea was that these flop houses were allowing for these, um, uh, uh, these characters to uh, get by without um, uh, essentially uh, going through these work tests and proving their worthiness. Um, now, while they're doing this, and again, one of the arguments of my book is that homelessness is not a minor, minor concern of the city um, business elites, uh, the political elites in the city. Uh, in fact, it's really at the center. But the other thing they are, of course, concerned about is transforming this downtown uh, business district. district. Uh, their, their interest in, in, in addressing the disorderly appearance of the downtown area uh, is shaped by the Columbia Exposition of 1893 and the City Beautiful Movement, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. That, of course, um, impacted the development of the national uh, capital, the mall, and the federal triangle, which uh, eliminated many 
um, working class neighborhoods uh, to make way for that, the Federal Triangle buildings. But also um, at the same time, um, there was the group plane of 1903 uh, conducted in Cleveland, Ohio, designed by Daniel Burnham, who also worked on both the Columbia Exposition and uh, on the Washington DC plan. And their explicit goal was to create a downtown playground. Um, <clears throat> Daniel Burnham argued, the jumble of buildings that surround us in our new cities contributes nothing valuable to life. On the contrary, it sadly disturbs our peacefulness and destroys the repose within us, which is the true basis of contentment. Uh, and so he was very interested in the neighborhood that they, they demolish in order to make way uh, for the group plan is very deliberately chosen. It's a working class neighborhood that's probably the most heterogeneous uh, neighborhood in the city of Cleveland. Uh, also happens to be the center of the vice district. Um, it's not initially part of the group plan, which is first includes um, public buildings such as city hall, federal courthouse, the public library. But the very first addition and change to the plan is to add a convention center. Um, <clears throat> the Chamber of Commerce argued, if Cleveland can attract 20 conventions or expositions a year to the city, the present standard of our hotels, our retail stores, other institutions will naturally, necessarily, and with profit to themselves be elevated. Um, uh, there I go, I'm pressing the wrong button. Uh, and so here you can see the, uh, this is in 1922, um, the, this is the new convention center, here's City Hall. This is the main um, mall uh, in Cleveland of the group plan. This area over here, had been the center of the business district, and this neighborhood had been on the outskirts of the business district, but had been demolished uh, to make way for all of these public buildings. And then this new building was a private uh, building, the Terminal Tower Complex, uh, that eliminated another working class neighborhood called the Haymarket District. And these, these ended up successfully destroying uh, many of those cheap, affordable working class hotels right prior to the onset of the Great Depression. Oh, I think maybe my, there we go. So the 1930s, and I will say one of the things that I've learned as I was wor working on this book is that my book is to some extent looking at the causes of homelessness being not about the pathologies um, and shortcomings of individuals who are unhoused, but really about the pathologies of the folks that are leading the city really and in shaping the policies um, uh, throughout this um, period of time. So in 1931, the Chamber of Commerce argued that uh, the depression could be minimized by persistent convention activity, um, that they would uh, stimulate millions in profits and business and advertise and sell the city of Cleveland uh, the very first thing they do is they promote a public works program that leads to the construction of a stadium called the Municipal Stadium in 1931. Um, at the same time, um, large numbers of unhoused people are um, making shanties along the lakefront and the riverfront right nearby this um, uh, group plan that I'll, I'll go back and show you some photos shortly. Uh, in order to address this disorder, of all of this emerging shanty towns, the growing numbers of panhandlers on the streets, which there's great concern will scare off the business traveler. Uh, the Associated Charities builds a 2000 bed shelter, uh, expansion of the Wayfarers Lodge, um, just uh, 10, 10 blocks to the east uh, of the group plan area. So in a light industrial uh, district um, that's within walking distance, but that can move folks outside of the downtown area so that the business travelers don't need to see these. Now, <clears throat> there were unfortunately, un well, I shouldn't say unfortunately, but they were unable to um, really uh, control the disorder on the streets. And in fact, many of those same areas that had been constru uh, constructed in this group plan uh, became the primary organizing grounds for the unemployment councils, uh, which organized uh, marches and protests uh, 1931, 1932, 1933, um, focusing their protests against the Associated Charities, storming city council, critiquing the new stadium as the boss's playground, uh, 
demanding higher levels of release, relief from the associated charities uh, and putting a halt to all evictions across uh, the city. Here are the shanty towns that were emerging along the lakefront. This particular burning on the far bottom right was done uh, right before the Great Lakes Expo of 1936 because the city officials were concerned that the shanty towns were going to detract uh, from travelers to the exposition. It's a, li a little more complicated, but I'll just leave it at that. Um, I think we're waiting. Uh, and this is the large warehouse shelter that's constructed um, the new Wayfarers Lodge, um, uh, where there were sig uh, significant intake procedures, really degrading procedures in order to get in and out of that shelter each night. Uh, and these are the large masses of crowds that gathered right in front of the main um, union uh, 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 terminal, the railroad terminal, that the business travelers were supposed to come in to get to these conventions, which caused great consternation uh, to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, but as I said, they protested, primarily focusing on the policies of the associated charities um, and the limitations of relief, as well as the Wayfarers Lodge. This is City Hall, they stormed City Hall. This particular day led to um, the death, the shooting death of two of the protesters um, that then subsequently um, uh, created uh, large scale protests uh, in neighborhoods, um, in particular in an African American neighborhood. Um, you can see here um, uh, that they're, uh, they're going to unite uh, Negro and white against the bloody CCRA. And this is the, uh, fe the federal agency, eventually the Associated Charities collapses, as I'll talk about in a second, and takes over the Associated Charities, and that's known as this, the Cuyahoga County Relief Administration. Um, in any case, uh, these are the new stadium, and you can see here uh, planning for the Great Lakes Expo. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, that was done as part of a public works project. Um, so with the establishment of the Civilian Works Administration, the Chamber of Commerce successfully um, is able to get the, the work that is done to actually prepare the landscape for the Chicago uh, Exposition. So many of the dwellers of the shanty tans who actually lived in this in this very same spot that where the largest shanty town had been, um, actually were employed to destroy their own uh, homes and to level this and prepare this uh, for the Great Lakes Expo. Um, the uh, federal in 1933, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration is established as as literally the because really. Um, of these significant protests, people were unwilling to accept the levels of relief that were being offered by uh, the Associated Charities and were protesting every week at these at, at all of the neighborhood um, uh, charity offices. And this led, leads to the collapse of the Associated Charities and its takeover um, by the federal um, program uh, that's funded, the federally funded program that's administered by this new um, agency called the Cuyahoga County Relief Administration that takes over the Wayfarers Lodge as well too. The National Industrial Recovery Act establishes the Public Works Administration housing difference, um, and, uh, housing um, uh, division. Uh, and this is geared really to, um, uh, this is what funds the very first public housing. Um, this is about really about um, providing resources both for the buildings, trades, the building, the builders who are, the, the building industry has collapsed and completely from 1928 um, and are big proponents of this. And also the banks who are unable, essentially who have what we in 2007 referred to as toxic assets uh, with all the foreclosed properties and inability of people to pay their mortgages. Um, we also, uh, the, so the very earliest um, public housing developments in Cleveland were not um, built for those who were um, low income, but were rather seen as a way to bring middle class white folks closer to the downtown business district and were seen as uh, uh, homes for um, white collar workers. 
Um, the, uh, Henry Wright um, believed that the public housing plan in Cleveland, he was the federal housing commissioner architect, would prove sufficiently attractive to draw back into the city center many families who now live on the outskirts. Um, this would bring the central districts back to economic value. Um, that, um, uh, so the very first public housing in Cleveland was racially segregated and the area, the housing that's um, closest to the downtown business district was reserved for white families only. Um, in response to the foreclosures and eviction protests across the country, really, the federal government uh, established the Federal Housing Administration and established um, the way, the, the essentially the modern way of buying uh, single family homes, the 30 year mortgage, or what becomes a 30 year mortgage. Um, but in the process of doing that, and that replaced a system where people used to have to pay 50% down on a house and have a five year uh, mortgage to pay the remaining 50% and not and didn't build any equity along the way. So, so the FH, this new way of buying homes was seen as a significantly advantageous for working class families, but it also institutionalized uh, the redlining system, um, uh, neighborhood classification system uh, that prevented these loans from um, federally backed loans from being um, uh, accessed by African American homeowners. And so this creates um, this, these new racially segregated landscapes of the 40s, 50s, uh, and 60s. This is the neighborhood. There's a photo taken of the neighborhood that was cleared to make way for the first public housing in Cleveland, Cedar Central. Um, this was a predominantly African American neighborhood that was bordering um, uh, the downtown business district. They, clearly took this photo because of the horse and drawn carriage here um, uh, to show its dilapidated characteristics, um, which was what their intent was. Um, and they demolished that neighborhood uh, in order to construct what was seen as um, really kind of state-of-the-art modern, um, I guess what we would consider to be condos or for um, uh, white collar workers. But uh, they were publicly, of course, publicly owned. Um, <clears throat> during the war, the Wayfair's Lodge largely empties out. Uh, and that's um, because large numbers of people are working, are able to get jobs in the war industries. Um, but there's a significant irony here in that um, the high levels, the, during the 1930s, there are high levels of people who are unhoused, but also high levels of housing vacancies, right? Because people are unable, landowners are unable to make a profit, people are unable to pay their rent. Um, and so uh, the, uh, that gives way to low levels of unemployment and low levels of vacancies in the 1940s, high levels of housing crowding, right? And so this, to some extent, I think emphasizes the way in which it's not just access to housing and having housing available um, that um, uh, is what homelessness is about. Because here you have a system where, where there's plenty of housing in the 1930s, um, but people are unable to access it because no one can make a profit off of that. Uh, the woodlot is abandoned in the 1940s as the fixation on unwillingness to work gives way to a new medicalized pathology of alcoholism, of uh, focusing on alcoholism. Alcoholics Anonymous is formed in the 1930s, late 1930s, um, and uh, quickly gets established, is embraced by the Salvation Army um, as they start establishing beds um, for people who are alcoholics who then have to attend these meetings. Uh, private employment agencies in the 1930s collapse and uh, in the 19, uh, during war, the federal government um, helps push uh, state employment agencies to uh, rationalize wartime labor migration uh, markets. And really so from 1940s through the early 1980s, um, state governments are providing significant uh, employment services and pl job placement opportunities. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce in the 1940s first proposes the establishment of the Interbelt Highway to protect the downtown business district from African-American neighborhoods. Their effort to make that neighborhood of Cedar Central 
a white neighborhood uh, quickly gives way as there's a large influx of African-American wartime workers during World War II, uh, and that, becomes, become, that neighborhood becomes the um, uh, principal place of um, destination place for the new migrants. Um, builders in the 1940s fight against robust public housing. So while they supported a public housing in the 1930s because there was no other opportunities, they specifically seek to uh, restrict um, those um, programs in the 1940s. Um, and so that the only places that these programs are allowed to continue are in the neighborhoods that are unable to access this new federally backed mortgage financing. Um, and the Housing Act of 1949 establishes the Urban Renewal Program, which again focuses on those areas that are, those redlined areas that are unable uh, to access this mortgage financing. They're predominantly occupied by African Americans. Uh, and this is the initial drawing, and this Interbelt Highway then gets constructed uh, with the dollars from the Federal um, Highway Act of 1956. Um, of course, in the 1950s and 60s, this leads to this, uh, the builders focus their, private builders focus their attention on um, the suburban developments for um, white only homeowners, um, urban renewal projects demolish large swaths of African American neighborhoods in the city. Um, uh, they also focus their attention on the Skid Row neighborhoods in the downtown um, business district. Um, and they established a new form of uh, conservation programs uh, on the near west side where working class white neighborhoods uh, that also become a kind of significant precursor um, to um, uh, uh, policies that promote gentrification and in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s that are geared towards rehabilitating old homes. Um, the Downtown Development Corporation is formed in the 1950s, and it argues that downtown must, for its preservation and progress, organize all its component parts for a full-scale effort to attract more good customers downtown to shop, eat, work, and play, right? So these things that we typically associate with the 1980s and 90s are really being thought of well before that um, period of time. Uh, in 1965, the Cleveland Development Foundation issued a report on downtown living and argued we'll have real problems attracting tenants if they're children, and you can see by tenants they're thinking white tenants, if their children have to attend schools whose population is primarily Negro. Uh, furthermore, the report noted, the racial question is a good one. The main reason why most downtown residences are high cost is to try and minimize this problem. Right, so very ex explicitly, they were building um, uh, uh, very expensive housing. They argued that they needed to um, bring in folks who were retired, who were above childbearing age, as well as um, bachelors, uh, which you know I suppose was their way euphemism uh, for referring to um, uh, gay men. Uh, and so the urban renewal program specifically becomes known as kind of the Negro removal program uh, as these African-American neighborhoods are demolished. There is all the way up until uh, 1959 with the Housing Act of 1959, a mandate that if the um, housing is demolished, there has to be um, uh, housing provided, right? But that housing was significantly provided in areas, this, this is um, what Arnold Hirsch writes about in his book, The Making of the Second Ghetto, leads to the development of high-rise um, public housing in really areas uh, that were um, the least desirable, that private developers weren't interested in. Uh, and so in Cleveland, um, they literally build um, these relocation housing uh, on a um, slag dump from the steel mills that um, uh, they call Garden Valley. And this is the downtown business district. So 1959 Housing Act for the first time allows urban renewal to be used without um, the uh, development of new housing. 
Uh, and that's because there's a recession in 1958 that causes um, the, uh, essentially the resale value of homes in inner city areas to start collapsing. Prior to 1958, those are seen as um, major investments. Um, uh, the, um, uh, because of the overcrowding in those homes leading to significant rates of return. But that collapses um, in the recession of 1958. Businesses and industries in Cleveland start moving to the outer ring suburbs as well as the south. This prompts uh, significant numbers of new migrants to um, slow down to a trickle. And this leads to kind of this collapse of the housing markets in inner cities. So, uh, the idea is that there's too much housing in order to restore the market vitality, um, that vitality uh, they're, gonna, they're allowing urban renewal just to simply go in and destroy homes uh, and replace them with non-residential um, projects. And this is one of the first where they destroy a rooming house district, Skid Row hotels to make way for the Erie View. This one was planned by I.M. Pei, who then goes on to uh, design the rock and roll Hall of Fame, which is also um, right around the corner from this particular picture. Um, <clears throat> importantly, and I just want to add this, uh, deinstitutionalization begins really in 1956 in Ohio and culminates uh, in 1974. Many of these folks who are um, moved out of the um, asylums do move into rooming houses, um, uh, which are in those very same neighborhoods that are being targeted for removal, right? So, so it's the, the discussion and talk about deinstitutionalization is really much more complicated than simply um, the, being a cause of uh, modern homelessness. City council members um, uh, throughout the late 1950s as um, there becomes significant outward push of African-American families call on the police to police racial boundaries and lines uh, and use um, police brutality as a means to do so. And so there's significant escalations in police brutality in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, as I said, the industries are moving out and you also have white collar private uh, employment agencies starting to see a comeback, uh, and they are pushing at the state level for the deregulation of the industry. Of course, um, uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time, this, there are significant rebellions uh, in 1966 in Cleveland in what are known as the Huff Riots or rebellions. Um, you can see here, they're specifically, oops, uh, that was the wrong one. They're specifically protecting um, the urban renewal, Euclid University Urban Renewal Office, um, which had been uh, targeted. Um, I have this picture here because this becomes kind of the iconic image of the African-American arsonist uh, destroying uh, the neighborhoods that we've seen used in, um, uh, uh, to kind of talk and really argue for the benefits of redevelopment and gentrification ever since to, to replace the neighborhoods that had been burned down by the riots. Um, however, very few neighborhoods and actually uh, no neighborhoods were burned down uh, during the riots. There were businesses that were targeted, um, but the actual impact of arson was significantly less than what would follow um, by city backed and landlord uh, sponsored arson. Um, <clears throat> As I talked about, that you had the collapse of real estate markets in African American neighborhoods. In the early 1960s, the city of Cleveland starts using arson as a form of, or using fire as a form of demolition because it's much cheaper uh, than other forms of demolition, but they are prevented from doing so because of the smoke um, and the problems with smoke that are, are being created in the neighborhood um, by courts. In response, what they do is we start throughout the late 60s and early 70s, cutting back and removing fire stations in neighborhoods where they're seen um, as too much housing, um, particular uh, African-American neighborhoods and some working class white neighborhoods. They cut arson investigators 
and turn the other way as landlords burned down tens of thousands of housing units in Cleveland alone in the 1960s and 70s. And this becomes uh, black neighborhoods lost, uh, many on the east side lost over 40% of their housing uh, stock uh, due to this arson epidemic. This is a federally, um, uh, this is a problem that's of uh, national scale. Um, uh, the federal, fire, federal Riot Reinsurance Act um, essentially provided fire insurance and subsidies to uh, insurance companies um, to, um, so that they um, uh, were essentially able to turn the other way and reimburse landlords knowing that they would have minimal risk. And so we had a nationwide uh, arson epidemic uh, in particular in the 1970s. Most of these were done home by home, single family home. In some cases, uh, because of just, uh, just disasters, lar whole neighborhood blocks were burned down uh, as fire spread. And this is one uh, instance of that spread, but uh, tens and thousands of units were uh, burned down. Um, uh, uh, rather, Richard Nixon replaces the urban renewal program um, with the Community Development Block Grant Program in 1974. Uh, this um, uh, allows uh, cities, they no longer have to have clear plans, they do not have to have a redevelopment plan, and in fact, um, the, the uh, gov federal government um, uh, sends two folks out, George Romney, who's the Secretary of Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Anthony Downs, who recently passed away, uh, to argue that it was perfectly a good idea to use all the community development grant monies for demolition, uh, demolition alone. And so uh, George Romney argued that out migration in the process of abandonment and neighborhood decay may be essential to make large blocks of cleared land available for redevelopment. And the idea here was rather than the urban renewal program where they would clear the blocks and then immediately redevelop, they would put this land into a land bank and hold it with the understanding that it might be 30 years down the road for the redevelopment to take place. Uh, George Voinovich, who was then the county auditor, later became the mayor of the city and then became the governor, uh, senator and governor, uh, argued uh, that the urban wasteland of today could be the growth frontier of tomorrow. And so these neighborhood, um, this kind of abandoned lots that start emerging uh, were not at all caused uh, by uh, the um, urban riots of the 1960s, but were really caused uh, by um, this arson epidemic coupled with uh, city-sponsored demolition uh, and policies that promoted uh, the accumulation of these lots into land banks. Uh, the remaining downtown lodging houses and flop houses were demolished to make way for stadiums and the development of Cleveland State University. Um, much of these new developments were sponsored by, um, with significant tax abatements, um, uh, public financing, et cetera. And so we see a turn from kind of, at least uh, with all its hypocrisy of the urban renewal period of the idea of at least that they would build the high rise housing in this um, undesirable location. That gives way entirely to just using federal and, and public monies to sponsor private luxury development. And so we have the development of stadiums, luxury hotels, office buildings that are all benefiting from public dollars. This is uh, a, this uh, particular um, demolition um, crane is called, uh, you can't really see it well, it's inner city wrecking. Uh, so interesting photo. Uh, this is, um, you can see now the, the construction of the, Inner belt here, you have the new um, uh, Cleveland State University campus that has been constructed right on what was the rooming house district and many cheap hotels have been here. Eventually uh, there's construction of the new stadium in this area, uh, the baseball stadium, the current baseball stadium in the basketball arena um, that uh, demolished another working class residential hotel area in the downtown business district and this being one of those on Bolivar Road, uh, and this is the parking garage uh, for uh, what are now the Cleveland Guardians uh, baseball stadium. Uh, 
this is taken from the exact same vantage point, I should say. Uh, that's, that's what it used to look like. This is that same spot, uh, what it looks like today. Um, <clears throat> in the 1970s, uh, you have um, the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention Control Act of 1970 that dramatically escalates um, and expands the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, allocates billions of dollars um, to uh, law enforcement, and, and um, this war on drugs is consolidated under the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration in 1973. In the city of Cleveland, these dollars are spent on Impact uh, Cities program, which is a federal program that specifically targets African American communities with saturation policing. Um, in the 1980s, there are continued efforts to use this saturated policing um, by the mayor, who's actually a, uh, Mike White, who is African American himself, who argues uh, that these policing techniques need to be used to generate confidence um, in uh, bringing wealthy people back into the city, that crime can be kept under control so that they can come back into the city and live um, uh, without fear. Um, and um, the, the um, policing policies of the 70s and 80s create significant problems with overcrowding in prisons that are addressed through a series of acts in the Reagan administration as well as in the uh, Clinton administration uh, that allocate billions of federal dollars to expand uh, the prison system. Uh, and so really we have um, huge increases in the amount of people who are incarcerated um, that really um, uh, expand from 1980, so the, uh, all the way through uh, 2000 uh, and, and beyond. Um, companies are moving to the outskirts of the city. Uh, they increasingly become dependent on a new breed of day labor agencies to provide them with a labor pool of, of workers. And these labor agencies, industrial lab, day labor agencies uh, that start emerging in the 1970s are paying their workers minimum wages and providing access to a new pool of industrial workers um, that um, these companies can let go of on a given, no without any um, notice uh, and not pay any benefits uh, and pay extraordinarily low wages and that are ununionized. Uh, 1983, the Jobs Training and Partnership Act actually ends up ending the uh, federal sponsorship of job placement programs and also allows the federal government itself to hire temporary workers through private labor agencies. And so this significantly um, impacts the rise of these new employment uh, agencies, um, temporary day labor agencies. One, one of them, not the biggest, but one of them being this company, Ameritemps in Cleveland. Um, <clears throat> Labor Ready being really the, and Manpower being the largest national ones. Um, by the 1980s, um, again, as I said, you have the funds from the Community Development Block Grant, coupled with tax abatements, other incentives from the city to subsidize and construct and renovate luxury housing. So not only the construction in the downtown business district, but also in the residential neighborhoods. And you have a new network across the city of community development corporations that facilitate uh, this, um, these new uh, developments to entice wealthy people uh, to the city. And here again is a photo done from the exact same spot in the 1960s in the Huff neighborhood, uh, where you had um, basically all of that housing demolished, give way uh, to this one single family home that received significant tax abatements. Uh, and incentives. And so this is what they're referring to when they talk about the gentrification of their neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> somewhat unique approach to gentrification. And this is another area uh, where this had in fact uh, been an old hotel that had been converted into a flop house that was then demolished and supported by city dollars in order to create private condominiums. Um, so while wages are slashed, unemployment uh, um, rates are, are rising, federal and state governments began to scale back their welfare programs in the 1970s. Uh, and this escalated, uh, this erosion of social spending escalated in the 1980s during the Reagan administration. Uh, one advisor uh, to the president, R George Gilder, argued the poor must work hard and they must work harder than the classes above them. We see that, of course, similar arguments uh, even today. 
uh, to this very day. In Ohio, Governor George Voinovich eliminated the state-run general assistance program that had paid cash directly uh, to uh, single individuals who were experiencing poverty. Uh, and he designated money uh, that was saved from uh, slashing general assistance to create emergency shelter warehouses. So again, you have this very similar logic of eliminating outdoor relief to create new institutionalized, what was referred to as indoor relief. And so to some extent this, well, what I argue is this is a form of new institutionalization, the creation of new system for accessing social services, seen as the emergency shelter as kind of a central clearinghouse, similar to the role that the Wayfarers Lodge played uh, in the 1890s. Uh, temporary day labor agencies lobbied heavily uh, to support the passage of the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, which eliminated entitlements um, uh, uh, to families with dependent children uh, with the idea that this would make them have a, um, a more dependable labor force. Uh, they wouldn't see the numbers of workers decline as significantly at the beginning of the month when people received checks. Uh, Clinton established uh, what became known as the Continuum of Care Program. And this is again, uh, when I talked early about the, um, uh, the uh, logic of the scientific charity movement, the idea was in order to access services, one had to go first prove one's willingness and worthiness to achieve those services by going to the emergency shelter and participating in NA and AA meetings, uh, and then to be able to, after successfully showing one's sobriety, move into temporary supportive housing. Uh, if one was able to, uh, from that point on, um, get a job, move into permanent unsupported housing, uh, that was on the, the individual. However, uh, studies end up showing that actually fewer people are able to access housing through this continuum of care model uh, than if they just go out and do it on their own. Uh, and that's because um, after proving if, if one relapsed in the temporary supportive housing, they would have to go back to square one to the emergency shelter. Um, this is a program that has since um, uh, been um, uh, the argument um, by those who support housing first policies have, have argued that first one should get access to housing. Uh, and then, and, and I'm not going to actually get all the way into these details, and then um, uh, they can deal with their issues, right? Uh, still, even the Housing First um, program still uh, really kind of see the causes of homelessness as being a product of individuals that need to address their issues and that can do that more successfully if they have housing, right? Rather than, and, and much, much of the difficulty and complexity of uh, the housing first and the failures of the housing first policies is that they're still time limited and there's still no access to affordable housing after those time limits run out. So, um, and I should just say now, Bank uh, Carson, the Secretary of HUD under the Trump administration, argued for the return to the continuum of care. That was his primary um, uh, housing policy uh, or homeless policy uh, in the Trump administration. Um, oops, wrong way. And so uh, in the mid, uh, in the late 1990s, there are significant numbers of people who are experiencing homelessness, growing numbers of shanty towns across the city of Cleveland, large numbers of panhandlers. Um, the city is trying to promote business travel, corporate travel, um, the promoting its own renaissance. Uh, and so they decide that they're going to invest in a large number of beds in an emergency shelter. And coincidentally, uh, place it 10 blocks to the east of where um, the group plan of 1903 had been constructed, which was the exact same spot, well, one block away uh, from where the Wayfarers Lodge had been built uh, in the 1930s. And that is where we are today. So that brings me an end to my presentation. Uh, and I think now's a good time for questions and answers. Comments. Thank you.
Is it mic? Okay, there we go. I'll go first. Is this on? Okay. So recently, both the cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul had rent control initiatives on their ballots. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether or not they have a positive or negative impact on um, preservation of affordable housing. I wonder if you have an opinion on that. Uh, honestly, I don't have an opinion on that. If anything, my main opinion would be um, that in order to essentially uh, essentially address these issues, there needs to be kind of organizations of people who are experiencing poverty and tenants. And to the extent, I guess, not knowing this campaign, uh, to the extent that tenants are supporting the rent control, then I guess I would uh, be in support. I'm just thinking, sorry, I'm brainstorming. <laughs> but yeah, I would think that that would be the group that I would side with. Um, the folks that are actually um, experiencing these issues and, where, and making sure that they're involved with uh, whatever the solutions are. Um, that I think is the thing where we're seeing um, uh, is, is left out. Uh, that in the 1930s and all the way before, there have been significant efforts to see people who had been experiencing poverty as potential folks who could transform um, the politics of the, of the situation, who could be involved in shaping their everyday lives. But increasingly, I think we've seen those, uh, um, uh, the folks through these lenses of pathology and in individualized pathologies as not being able to um, be involved. So that, that would be, um, I guess my, my general gut feeling in terms of looking at it was seeing where the people are on this, who are being impacted by uh, these policies. I was noticing that the first half or so of the photographs, it looked like it was mostly single men. And then uh, how, when would you say that the entire family and homeless women and homeless children did that change or was yeah. it always like that? Uh, no, it did. Uh, there were always, um, and that's a, that's a really good uh, question because part of the reason why we don't have the, as many photos of the women is because they are not seen as public. There are, there are actually, uh, there's an argument uh, made all the way through. There's not an equivalent of the Wayfair's Lodge for women, that women are actually housed separately and part of the argument um, that's made by the Associated Charities is that white women should not be punished by having to sleep with African-American women. So there's racial segregation in terms of the access to housing for women where the, um, in, in children, there is, there's really nothing for families uh, in the 1930s. Um, the uh, shanty towns are inhabited by women as well, but there's significant um, efforts by the women uh, and the shantytown residents not to disclose their presence because that's seen as putting those shantytowns at risk as well. And that for the women who are seen as most disreputable, um, they're still, uh, whereas the police have been pushed out of running shelters for men, uh, the police are, are running um, shelters, uh, are, are housing the most disreputable women uh, up to uh, the 1930s. Uh, I will say in the 1950s, in this period where the Wayfarers Lodge is, is clearing out, the Salvation Army successfully petitions to create a women's shelter uh, for alcoholics. Uh, and this is the first time uh, that, that women are seen, uh, that, that the argument is made that women can be housed in congregate shelter situation. Um, Obviously, that impacts and shapes later and subsequent policy um, to this day, but there's still significant gender divisions in terms of the ways in which the homeless services are distributed to women and men. Um, and so I think the reason we see more photos of the men is because they're seen as kind of more publicly accessible, if that makes sense. Um, so the women are a part of this story all along. I will also say um, there are certainly, 
significant gender dimensions to the establishment of federal housing policy that's based and rooted on the single family home uh, and the idea of the nuclear family. There had been alternative proposals uh, to create kind of collective housing um, possibilities uh, that could have also potentially uh, created very different scenarios as far as um, uh, having group kitchens and all these sorts of other things. There were a lot of creative ideas in the 1930s um, that were uh, pitched as alternatives to what uh, eventually becomes federal policy. And so um, that, that's, you know, that's another, I think, significant component that, that um, gives rise and shapes the uh, kind of gender divisions. But there are very strict efforts to segregate men from women. Uh, in, in, uh, and that's one of the policies that really comes out from the Associated Charities and the Scientific Charity Movement and persists to this very day in terms of the distribution of uh, homeless services. And that's a huge bone of contention for people who are experiencing homelessness is how uh, can they preserve, their, preserve intimate relationships um, where there are relationships uh, that people want to preserve um, between men and women as well. We have a question from online. Yes, we do. Our first question is, can you say more about the impact of deinstitutionalizing the mental health system on homelessness? Okay, I'm not sure. I can't see who's has it. Would you mind raising your hand? Okay. Oh, online, okay, yes. Um, so the deinstitutionalization I think is fairly complicated because the primary, uh, in the 1950s, the primary um, individuals who were in institutions were white women and who were older women, right? And that had to do with the, primarily because African-American families uh, didn't put their family members in institutions at the same level that white families did. Um, and, and, and I guess the, the primary thing I want to say here is that I don't think deinstitutionalization really has anything much to do uh, with the rise of homelessness. Uh, I do think the loss of collective um, uh, uh, shared housing possibilities, um, supportive housing possibilities that was done as a result of the clearing of these roaming house districts, et cetera, does have everything to do uh, with the creation of homelessness, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but I, again, this gets back to that comment I made about what kinds of housing do we value and what kinds of alternative housing um, could be uh, uh, create. The, the other thing too is as these neighborhoods are gentrified uh, and as wealthy people do move into these neighborhoods, one of the first things they target and want to get out of their neighborhoods, not only are the flop houses, et cetera, but also the group homes of people who are experiencing mental illness. So that to me is a much bigger issue uh, than the deinstitutionalization, which really pre you know, preceded um, you know, by a decade, the, the um, growth of the number of people who were uh, on the streets in the 1980s and 90s. Great, we've got a second question from the online chat from Jean Miriam. What was the role and effect of poor farms in ex-urban areas with homelessness? Of poor farms? Poor farms, correct. Um, okay, that's an interesting question. And it's something I didn't really get into. So in Cleveland, there was a mayor named Tom Johnson who was a, social, a socialist in the early 20th century who actually constructed this large farm uh, and, and argued that the Associated Charities was never going to be able to adequately meet the needs of those who are unhoused. So the, the farm is to, there were those um, such as, I can't remember if you saw the guy pointing at the Interbelt um, Freeway uh, on the city. He was very intent, that was Ernst Bone. He was very intent on promoting gentrification, on bringing wealthy folks back to the city. And one of his arguments was that we can push everybody out to the suburbs, all the, or not the suburbs then, to farms so that they can live in subsistence living, um, push uh, uh, impoverished African-Americans in particular into these farms. So 
there are these kind of competing interests to establish those farms. That's all foreclosed as that land becomes seen as um, essential for suburban development. Um, so, uh, but those, those are certainly um, discussions that are being had in the 1930s, uh, all the way from the 19 teens to the 1930s. Okay, we'll do one more question. Um, I'd like to uh, ask the question uh, with regards to homelessness across time, the percentage that have been men and the percentage that have been women. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> that's, uh, I, I think, an interesting question. I don't have the quantitative you know, data to really you know, give you a keen sense. My general sense is women have always been there. Um, we have significant evidence to that effect. Um, so, you know, I, I would think it's much less than we would, we would necessarily think. I do think that it's, it's, it's certainly an issue that we could, that, that um, other sociologists have probably spent more time studying in terms of the impact of the 1996 Welfare Reform Act. One thing that they did discover in the late um, 1990s was this um, somewhat of a, a surprising effect that there were more single men who were homeless when they cut them aid for families and dependent children, AFTC, which had been a program for women and children. And the reason for that, at least the argument um, was that um, as families had less and less resources uh, that they had to essentially preserve them for the women and the children and the single men took to using shelters as a way to kind of expand their their uh, familial resources. So um, th there's undoubtedly some something to be said about that question and ways in which those numbers do change at certain periods of time and are impacted by different policies. But but I don't have the answer for that. Just uh, one question, a landscape uh, question. Uh, this country was basically uh, rural for many, well, for at least the first century and then we had urbanization. To what degree was there homelessness during that rural period of time? And of course, did urbanization encourage homelessness? Uh, well, certainly in terms of what we're talking about in terms of all of these systems of control of homelessness are, are in, in very much about urbanization, industrialization, you know, with the late 19th century. Um, but at the same time, you know, there are uh, the, the origins of the deserving versus the undeserving of um, uh, moving people out of uh, communities of who who's a, a resident who's not, you know, poor houses, etc. So there is a much earlier history that I'm not that I'm sparing you. I, don't, I only did have 50 minutes. So I'm sorry. Yeah. But, um, uh, but there is a much earlier history. I do think um, uh, Ken Customer has written a book, uh, Down and Out, that covers some of that really uh, that early history. Uh, at the same time, I think um, you know m much more could be could be done about it. But there is there's definitely some material about that. Uh, um, yeah, I I'm, I know it's probably not the best answer, but excellent. Well, thank you all for coming out today. Um, for our history forum and thank you to uh, Daniel Kerr for coming all further away from DC.